Good morning. Can I uh, welcome our four witnesses uh, this morning? Um, this is the penultimate uh, evidence session of this inquiry. Um, we've got six or seven questions we want to go through with you. Uh, for the record, would you kindly just introduce yourselves? Right, I'm James Bidler. I'm an Associate Medical Director in NHS Local Transplant. I'm also a liver physician up in Birmingham. I'm Lorna Williamson. I'm a consultant haematologist and I'm medical and research director with NHS Blood and Transplant. I'm Paul Cosford. I'm the medical director and director for health protection for Public Health England. Um, I'm Katie Schinker. Um, I'm a consultant scientist and epidemiologist at Public Health England's Centre for Infectious Disease Surveillance and Control. Uh, I've been the head of the CJD section there for the last two years. Thank you very much. Uh, in your view, when someone in the UK receives a blood transplant, can we be confident that they're not being infected with uh, abnormal prions? I think I'll take this one. Um, there is, of course, a good deal of uncertainty about the, the risk of variant CJD from transfusion. So since 1996, there has been a collaboration between the UK Blood Services and the CJD Research and Surveillance Unit, a study called the Transfusion Medicine Epidemiology Review, to try to establish whether there is any link between receiving a transfusion and uh, acquiring variant CJD. So what that study has found um, is that with about 50 million, five zero million individual components transfused since 1996. Sadly, there have been three patients who developed variant CJD between six and eight years after a blood transfusion and in whom their donor also went on to develop variant CJD, suggesting that their transfusion may have been the source of the infection. There was a fourth recipient um, who had no symptoms during life, but who at post-mortem did show signs of, of variant CJD. Um, importantly, all of these four patients were transfused in the 1990s before the onset of leukocyte depletion, which we implemented in 1999. Now, there are a further six patients um, who were transfused and, and sadly also developed variant CJD between four and 16 years after the transfusion, but in whom the donors have remained well. So we have tracked over 100 donors to those recipients for periods up to 20 years, and none has yet developed variant CJD. So in those six, the source of the infection is not known. It might be diet or, or it might be... Um, the transfusion. Um, again, of those, uh, five were transfused before leukocyte depletion um, and the sixth in 2002. So we have not had any notifications of transfusion recipients developing variant CJD since the last case transfused in, in 2002. So with regard to the future, there is a good deal of uncertainty. Uh, therefore, we, we do still want to keep and, if possible, improve the preventative steps that we take against variant CJD, um, which I'm sure we'll come on to discuss. Um, from the point of view of Public Health England, of course, we are uh, absolutely clear that the most precautionary uh, steps need to be taken. What, what we've got... Uh, is the prevalence that we see in the Appendix 2 study of uh, potentially 1 in 2,000 people with prion protein within appendices, but that not being reflected in the numbers of uh, cases uh, in terms of variant CJD. And so the mix of both um, standard universal precautions in the blood supply system uh, and then specific precautions that are taken when we identify somebody as having uh, a, a risk for public health purposes of CJD where there are extra precautions taken. Uh, we believe those to be the right set of precautions in order to minimise risk. Uh, Dr Williamson's correct obviously that 
you can't abolish risk completely. It is about uh, minimising risk as far as yes, possible. Yes, but uh, um, taking into account what practices you know, elsewhere in the world, the advancement of science, uh, the information that you've gathered, is there anything more that you could feasibly do to reduce risk? Well, at, at this point, um, we have nothing on the table today that has been proven to be effective uh, that would reduce risk further. The two technologies which we're tracking very carefully are uh, the development of blood tests, of course, um, and we've also worked for a number of years uh, on assessment of prion filtration. So these technologies remain of interest, but there is nothing today on the table that we could implement. One um, safety step that, that uh, may be useful in, in the future is, of course, we have young donors coming through, born after 1996, when the food chain was deemed to be BSE-free, if you like. And they are now turning 17 and 18 and are old enough to be blood donors. Now, we don't know for sure that that population is entirely risk-free, and there would, is a study ongoing of appendix samples in that cohort. And we also need to be just sure that they're not going to pose any new risks, uh, given what 17 and 18-year-olds get up to. So we're doing a study of, for example, Epstein-Barr virus, the glandular fever virus, uh, and others, to make sure that we don't inadvertently uh, in bring in new risks. For example, if we were to use such donors for transfusion of babies or children, we need to know as much about the profile of safety uh, as far as possible. Uh, and of course it will take several years for um, that cohort of donors to produce enough donations to, to have a reliable supply uh, for vulnerable recipients. Uh, we, we do a lot of marketing with, with 17, 18 year olds, uh, but we know they're busy people, they've got a lot going on, they travel uh, and, and so on. So. Um, that's something for the future, but it's not robust at this point. So the um, appendix study to which you referred, are there any early indications uh, of, of where that's leading us? and uh, When you expect the findings to be presented? The um, appendix three study, which is currently underway, we're expecting to be complete uh, in 2015. We're keeping under review any findings as they come through, but the, the uh, importance is for the findings to be fully reviewed by the uh, Advisory Committee on Dangerous Pathogens, and we'll have the outcome of that in 2015. The Appendix 2 study, which was the study you'll be aware of on 32,000 yep. uh, specimens, suggested a, a, a prevalence of abnormal prion protein in appendices of 1 in 2,000 um, it, across the, the population that that's uh, studied. Going back to your previous question, the difficulty that we have is that we don't know what that means in terms of um, prion um, presence in, in the blood, and we don't have the, the testing uh, procedure uh, as yet in order to find that out. But what we do know is that that doesn't appear to be reflected in clinical cases of variant CJD. So that's the uh, important balance um, and consideration that we're, we're taking into account here. David. Thank you. Good morning. Um, you already touched on tests. If a prion blood screening test capable of being used at an in, on an industrial scale were to become available tomorrow, would NHS blood and transplant implement it? And if not, why not? So the, um, there are really, really two issues. Firstly, would, would such a test have a utility? And I think we're all in agreement that the next step uh, if there were a medium throughput test available would be to conduct a study of the UK population using blood samples to understand what the frequency of prion infection in the blood actually is as opposed to the appendix samples mm -hmm. because you know one in 2000 is, a, is quite a high number but we're not seeing that number of cases or thankfully that anything like the number of transmissions you might expect so we need to understand how risky blood actually is. Um, and you're quite right to, to mention throughput. Um, the, the, the criteria we would want from a test, and we discussed these with Professor Collins in 2011, 
would be a test of adequate sensitivity that would pick up a high proportion of, of infected people. Importantly, a test of high specificity. In other words, it doesn't throw up a lot of false positive reactions. And Professor Collingy's recent data using US samples is very encouraging because in 5,000 US samples, which are all assumed to be truly negative, there were no uh, reactions. They, they were all tested three times, um, but nevertheless, that provides encouraging information. Um, the, the key thing, though, is availability of the test at volume, because we test over 7,000 donors every day in, in the UK, and all of our virus screening tests come from manufacturers who have a track record in producing those to high consistency and with reliability of supply. And that's really what we would need um, for a variant CJD test as, as well. Um, it would need to be capable of a high, a high degree of automation uh, because we'd need the result really within 24 hours of the sample arriving uh, at a blood centre in order to be able to release blood components in a timely fashion. Uh, so the automation would need to include electronic transfer of the results into, into the computer so that the quarantine donations could be released. Um, so that's really a task uh, for test kit manufacturers to get what is essentially a prototype search test to high throughput. It's not something blood services have the capability to do. Right. On that point, are you, are you aware of the of the Prionics eQuick technology, yes. the uh, commercial diagnostics developer that uh, says it's in the process of, of evaluating a new test? Uh, and do you know what that evaluation involves and what the next steps are? Please? Yes, so, so eQuick um, was, was begun with by Prionics and in fact um, is now being further developed and evaluated in collaboration with NHS Blood and Transplant. Uh, Professor David Anstey's group in NHS BT Bristol uh, is taking that test forward and it's clear that it would potentially be a good confirmatory test but not for, for various technical reasons suitable for mass screening. But if we were to uh, implement mass screening we would need at least one confirmatory test um, with which to, to, to retest any samples that appear to be positive. So that eQuick assay is now being taken through the agreed evaluation process overseen by the National Institute of Biological Standards and Controls, NIBSC, who have a, a, an agreed protocol against which all candidate tests are being evaluated, uh, and we await the results of that. Can I just uh, interrupt here, uh, just for clarity, um, the NHS historically has not been very good at procuring from smaller companies, however successful they are. Are all businesses working in this field in an equal position, or is there a tendency uh, to only deal with the, the big players? Oh. Well, actually, the, the large virus test kit manufacturers with whom we deal mostly have not uh, approached us with candidate variant CJD tests. The companies that we've worked with through the Prion assay working group since 2007 have, have actually all been fairly small uh, companies. Um, and in collaboration with, with NIBS, we, you know, we have a standard um, protocol, <coughs> NIBS leading on assessment of sensitivity and the blood services leading on assessment of specificity. Uh, that protocol is, is in the public domain. It was provided to all the manufacturers. So there's, a there's been a level playing field, I think, okay. for candidate Sorry. assays. Right, um, and just moving on, so questions for you already. I mean, there, there seems to be evidence that the prototype test developed by MRC Prown Unit would pot could potentially be developed into something suitable for larger scale use. In your opinion, should the government support further development of this test? We would support um, the ability to screen the blood supply for um, abnormal prion protein. Uh, I mean, the facts of the 
epidemic of uh, variant CJD related to the period of time in which exposure through the meat supply system would suggest that the uh, cause uh, and effect is quite uh, clear there, but we can't be uh, absolutely certain and there are many uncertainties. So uh, in addition to monitoring the patterns of disease and the fact that the last variant CJD cases uh, from 2013 appears to be tailing off, um, would give us some reassurance uh, that the variant CJD um, epidemic is, is, is uh, through, um, or, or at least in, into a, 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 what may be a long tail of cases. But we can't be certain of that, and we must maintain our monitoring systems, which we do. And so we would certainly support the development of a, of a system to screen uh, blood. I, if I may, I, I would concur with that. I think, I think it's been difficult to know what more could have been done until it was established that the test had, had a good specificity. In other words, until the results of the US study were available. And these were published at the end of, of January. The UK Blood Services Prime Working Group met in the middle of February and discussed those results. Uh, and we have um, written to Professor Collins suggesting further discussions to include Public Health England because we do think a population study is the next step. Now I know there are potentially a, a questions around the sensitivity of the assay and that will need to be worked through with the team developing it and uh, also the fact that um, it, we, it would be good to compare it with other candidate tests side by side on the question of sensitivity. We've not had a chance to do that yet. Uh, but there is certainly scope for further discussion and progress. Thank you. Else want to comment on that? Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Um, Dr. Williamson, good morning. Nice to see you again. Um, I am right in saying that at the moment every uh, donated uh, amount of blood it goes through uh, leuco depletion. Is that right? Yes. It's, it's filtered. Yes. And the reason that it goes through that is because there it has the potential to reduce the number of prions in the blood. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, there are some newer technologies that have come along, uh, PCAP being one of those, uh, which is prion filtration. Uh, what is your experience and understanding of how effective that is uh, on blood that's already had uh, leuco depletion mm, applied? Mm. So, along with, in parallel with our work on candidate assays, uh, since 2006, the UK Blood Services has had a prime reduction working group to look at candidate filters. And you're quite right, the PCAP filter, um, initially developed by Prometic, was, was a technology that we uh, evaluated quite carefully. The way the, the group worked was that we met with manufacturers on a regular basis so that um, they were clear from the outset what our requirements were. So in 2006, we, uh, as with tests, we developed an evaluation protocol uh, that all manufacturers and, and filters were, were uh, prone, uh, had, had to follow. So based on evidence from um, the manufacturer, we then proceeded to the next step. Now, the Spongiform and Cephalopathy Advisory Committee uh, at that point it, it recommended that candidate filters be um, independently evaluated uh, for a number of reasons. Firstly, um, the technologies were developed by manufacturers who were bringing results to us and normally we would be able to um, see whether we could repeat those in, in, in the manufacturing context. That isn't possible with, with, with a prion filter because we don't have human blood samples that we know are infected and we can't take infectious material into the manufacturing environment. So SEAC recommended commissioning independent um, evaluations to a standard protocol, partly so that different manufacturers' filters could be uh, considered side by side to the same uh, protocol. In the, in the event, only the PCAPT filter uh, reached that point and some studies were commissioned uh, and performed in fact by the Health Protection Agency as, as was at the time, um, according to the recommendations of, of SEAC. 
um, that the final reason that that was particularly important for the PCAP filter was that the um, results the manufacturers had brought to us had been on a prototype. Um, the, the filter, the active ingredient, if you like, was a, was a resin that bound abnormal prions, and the prototype had put that resin into, into a column. Um, in manufacturing uh, environment, that had to be in, uh, manufactured into a filter, uh, and the company Maca Pharma picked that up and, and took that on. So the company had produced no data uh, to the same quality on the final filter as we were going to use it in the blood service. So that was what went through the independent evaluation. Um, so the results of that, I think, have been provided to committee uh, since they are commercial in, in confidence. The results were also reviewed by uh, SABTO in December 2012. Um, and at that point, SABTO concluded that uh, this technology should not be uh, implemented. I think one point I can make um, in open session is that we, uh, in, the, in the independent evaluation, there was a leukocyte depletion step prior to the prion filtration step. And the results of that were actually very encouraging in confirming the high effectiveness of leukocyte depletion in removing uh, infectious prions, which we had not established in the blood services until that point. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> one of the concerns around uh, the PCAP uh, prion filtration, the way that was assessed, was that it was tested on sheep. Um, uh, but it had already been identified that sheep was not a particularly good model for this particular filter. Why was it tested on sheep when it had already been identified that that mm. wouldn't necessarily give correct results? Um, so SEAC had recommended that, if possible, um, new filtration technologies be assessed in small animal models, which are, tend to be the standard ones, but also, if possible, in, in a large animal model. Um, and there was a study running in Scotland on uh, sheep assessing transfusion risk in general, look at the, uh, a model for leukocyte depletion and prion filtration. So that was um, an opportunity, if you like, to follow SEAC's uh, recommendation. Um, but I think it's fair to say that when the results all came to SABTO, obviously the, there was the, sh the sheep data, but also data from the standard small animal models, which um, HPA had run, uh, both what are called spiking studies, where blood is um, mixed with a mixture of, of infected brain material, uh, but more importantly, uh, endogenous studies, which actually use the blood of infected animals, thus mimicking the transfusion situation you know, better. Um, so those, if you like, were, were the standard accepted models. Um, the small animal study having been, uh, be, been quite similar to what the manufacturers had used themselves, in fact. Uh, okay, so you're, you're, you think that the filter was treated fairly by testing it on sheep, even though that was identified not as a particularly good... Well, it was a case, I think, of looking at all of the evidence together uh, from the spiking studies in mm. small animals the endogenous blood study in small animals, and, and also the sheep study. So the results were considered in the round. Okay. Um, so in your own view, uh, adopting the, the PCAP device would not improve the safety of blood in the transfusion service? The, the, um, the value of leukocyte depletion was, was shown to be high in that particular study, and SABTO taking all of that into account, and also revised estimates on the amount of infectivity in mm. blood, which the Advisory Committee for Dangerous Pathogens had reassessed and concluded that there was less infectivity in blood than had originally been thought. Uh, all of that taken together um, led SABTO to recommend that prime filtration not be implemented. And you're happy with that as a recommendation? Yes. Yes, okay, fine. Um, and so therefore, leukodepletion, you think, is, a, is a, a, a good system and have confidence that that is, is working well? 
Yes, we um, have an ongoing quality control uh, program, so a certain percentage of donations are actually tested to make sure that the white cell removal is as expected and is working consistently across all of the blood components we produce, so we apply it to red cells and platelets and indeed plasma. Okay. And presumably there is a cost in this uh, filtration. Do you, uh, you presumably do a um, cost effectiveness study on leukodepletion. How often is that undertaken and what was, uh, when was the last one and what was the outcome of that assessment? Yes, so when leukodepletion depletion was implemented, um, the filters had to be purchased separately and attached to, to the blood donations. Uh, but nowadays, um, the filter is an integral part of the blood bag. Um, so the costs relative to everything else have actually gone down considerably since this was first implemented in 1999. We estimate that all of the costs of leukocyte depletion are in the order of 4 to 4.5 million pounds per year. But there are other benefits of leukocyte depletion and countries, a number of countries unaffected by variant CJD also have this technology as a standard of care. So, for example, it removes um, a virus called cytomegalovirus, which is in the white blood cells, and SABTO, in fact, recommended um, two or three years ago that given the effectiveness of leukocyte reduction, testing was not additionally required to protect vulnerable patients from variant CG, uh, sorry, from cytomegalovirus, CM CMV. Um, so that's uh, an additional benefit of leukocyte depletion, as well as avoiding uh, very unpleasant reactions which patients sometimes have to the white cells in the transfusion. These white cells do the patient no good at all, they, they're of no benefit, but can cause very unpleasant chills, fevers, reactions, and so many countries have adopted this as a standard. Um, personally, I would not like to revert to a non depleted blood supply. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Williamson, uh, you answered a lot of the questions <laughs> that were returned. I'm afraid mine are, are the same and they're aimed at you as well, because I know you were chairing the working group on pathogen uh, mm. reduction technology. Uh, could you just tell us a bit about what pathogen reduction technologies have so far been adopted by an HSB2? Yes. So, so pathogen inactivation is, is, is a blanket term for, for a range of technologies designed to inactivate um, viruses, bacteria uh, and other agents like malaria, which, which might be in blood donation. Uh, they, they have no effect on prions, just to make that absolutely clear. Um, so at this point, uh, there is no licensed technology for pathogen inactivation of whole blood as collected from the donor, nor indeed for red cell transfusions, which are the, the, the vast majority of transfusions. Um, so what we're really discussing are techniques either for platelets or for fresh frozen plasma for, for direct use. So for platelets, um, SABTO considered pathogen inactivation back in 2010. At that point, there were concerns from trial data around the effectiveness of the platelets that had been through the pathogen inactivation process. And so at that point, SABTO did not recommend PI. Um, following that, NHSBT implemented an alternative to prevent bacterial um, transmissions which can occur particularly from platelets because they're stored at, at 20 degrees rather than in the fridge. Um, that has been extremely effective. Um, so in terms of the risk from platelets, um, we've had no bacterial infections since screening was implemented in 2009 and no viral infections from platelets since 2005. However, um, because um, there, are now, there is now a second uh, and, and indeed a third manufacturer with a platelet inactivation technology, and because there is more clinical trial data, SABTO um, implemented a, a further review 
uh, in 2013. And, and as you say, I chaired the group which, um, which did that piece of work. So the report was published um, two days ago uh, on, on the SABTO website. So we looked at a, a, a large body of evidence on um, the effectiveness of the current programs to, to keep platelets safe, um, how effective the pathogen and activation techniques were likely to be against a range of viruses and bacteria. We looked at the clinical trial data updated to, to see if there were side effects um, and, and also data from countries which have begun to implement platelet pathogen inactivation. Um, and then SABTO and, and DH analysts looked at the, the cost effectiveness. So um, the conclusions really were that the bacterial screening in place is, is highly effective. Uh, no proven transmissions um, in over 600,000 units uh, tested. Uh, of course, that technology, we, we don't expect to be 100% effective. We, we know that. Um, we can, so the, 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 um, the group then concluded that in terms of bacteria, more work probably needed to be done to understand whether uh, there could be strains of bacteria that would be missed or, or would not be inactivated by the technology. Um, the, the two candidate technologies depend on chemicals entering the, the bacteria and then a light step to inactivate some bacteria. Uh, may not have the chemicals penetrate adequately. So there is more work we're going to do on that. Um, with regard to viruses, it, it, it looks as if pathogen inactivation of platelets would be highly effective against the current uh, and emerging viruses that we, that we worry about. Um, in terms of clinical safety, it looks like there were no particular problems. The trial data showed good responses to platelets although it's possible that we may have to produce more doses of platelets um, to compensate for losses during the inactivation process. However, and this is on the, the public report, SABTO concluded that given the very high level of safety currently, the implementation of pathogen inactivation of platelets was very far from current cost-effectiveness benchmarks. So, in other words, the cost per quality of life saved would be over £1 million per quality, um, which is extremely high in relation to other healthcare interventions uh, and indeed the current safety parameters in place. So, for platelets, uh, pathogen inactivation is not recommended at, at the present time, which leaves um, fresh frozen plasma. Um, so. As I mentioned, um, pathogen inactivation doesn't inactivate prions. So to protect young recipients in particular who have likely had very little or no exposure to prions through diet, uh, SABTO recommended in 2004 that um, FFP for these patients should be imported from out with uh, the UK. Um, and we implemented that initially with, with US plasma. Uh, and because the background rate of viruses in that population is higher, we thought that rather than run the risk of you know, preventing one risk and introducing a new risk, we would actually pathogen inactivate that imported plasma, which is done in the blood services in the UK uh, using single donations, so we don't pull them all together. Uh, using a technique called methylene blue uh, and light uh, inactivation. So that is the standard product for young recipients. And then in addition, there is a commercial product called Octoplas, available from a company called Octopharma. Uh, that is a licensed medicinal, licensed by the MHRA. Um, it's manufactured by pooling two or 3,000 donations together and subjecting them to a solvent detergent process to inactivate uh, viruses. Um, that is specifically recommended by the British Committee for Standards in Hematology for certain patients having plasma exchange procedures. That's quite a small percentage of the overall use of FFP. 
But that product is available to hospitals. They can buy it directly from the manufacturer. Um, and that is, therefore, a choice that clinicians have um, as an alternative to the standard FFP from NHSBT, which is not um, pathogen inactivated. Chuck, that was a very detailed answer, yeah. and I think I'm, I'm happy. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if, if I may, Dr. Williamson, so this prohibition on fresh rosin plasma, prohibition, uh, admonition against use of fresh rosin plasma for young patients, that is comprehensively applied, is it within the UK? As far as we know, um, every hospital that treats children either purchases methylene blue plasma from NHS BT, I can't speak so much for the other UK mm. services, um, or uh, we're aware they, they use octoplas, so they use one or the other. And does the definition of young go up all the time, uh, if, it's yes. if it's dependent on on the exposure it's to dietary? Correct. It, it initially was children under 16, uh, which matched the, the 1st of January 1996 birth date, mm. but now these are 17, 18 year olds. Uh, it applies according to your date of birth, not your age. So that mm. entire cohort gets uh, imported plasma. Right. Thank you. Right. Has the <coughs> risk of prion transmission via surgery been uh, mitigated or uh, almost completely now? Well, there's a range of both standard precautions uh, and specific precautions for those who are identified as being at increased risk uh, of Varian CJD. Uh, and our view is that they uh, are based on a precautionary principle uh, and that the right uh, methods are there to minimise risk as far as possible. I'm going to ask Dr. Schinker if uh, she made her uh, come in and discuss some of the detail on that. Yeah, certainly. Um, so there are a, a two suites of guidance in place, one which is applicable to the general population, um, and that's using the precautionary principle that there may be an unknown risk of variant CJD, which have, we've yet to detect. So those are captured in the NICE uh, intervention, uh, interventional procedure guidelines 196, which came out in 2006. And they make a number of across-the-board recommendations which are using the precautionary principle that we should put in place general measures that will protect everyone. Um, the first of these is um, specific to neurosurgical procedures and recommends that neurosurgical surgical sets are kept together. And the reason for doing this is that <coughs> should there be any exposure through an undiagnosed um, variant CJD um, incident, that the number of subsequent patients who are exposed to those sets is very much limited, so it's one person at a time, rather than spreading those instruments out between sets and potentially proliferating infection that way. Um, the other um, uh, precaution is that neuro um, endoscopes should be rigid and be able to be autoclaved, so that's across the board for um, procedures that um, contact brain tissue. And then finally, um, much like some of the um, precautions in place for younger populations, um, it's recommended that a segregated set of instruments are available for people born after um, 1996, so that they're not exposed to the same instruments that are used on the general population who may have been exposed to BSC through their diet. So that's um, a set of measures in place for the general population. And in addition, there are some very specific um, precautions advised for people who have been identified as at increased risk of CJD and variant CJD. Um, there are around 6,000 of those uh, people who have been identified and for them um, it's advised that um, single use surgical instruments are used where possible and this is particularly for the certain types of surgical procedures that might um, involve contact with tissues that are thought to be infective for CJD. So it's not for all types of <coughs> surgery, but it's, it's um, for types of surgery where there may be an increased risk. Um, otherwise, if single-use instruments aren't available of a sufficiently high quality, um, if, if reusable instruments have to be used, then there are um, recommendations for the quarantining and disposal of those as required so that they're not used on subsequent patients. Thank you. I mean, two slightly different questions follow from, from that answer. 
How effective have the NICE guidelines been? Because they were guidelines, they weren't mandatory, were they? And then secondly, does the autoclaving technique always work? I think from previous oral evidence we've heard that the particular way prions bond to surgical instruments, we, un we were told, I think, that that, that meant that he heat treatment didn't work as effectively as it might. So, Okay. Um, the, the first... What we know so far is that we haven't identified any surgical transmission of variant CJD to date. Um, we know that there have in the past been surgical transmissions of sporadic CJD, and so we are being precautionary knowing that there is a potential risk of this. Um, there is very close follow-up of this through investigation of new cases that are diagnosed, um, investigating whether they have had surgical procedures in the past. Um, so as far as we know, there haven't been any surgical transmissions. Um, and the second question about autoclaving, the, the NICE guidelines are in place for surgical procedures used in the general population. So this is the population who are at a, a low and uncertain risk through their diet. That isn't the recommendation for people where we know there is an increased risk because we have evidence that there has been some potential exposure to a higher risk of CJD. For those individuals, um, it's recommended that instruments are disposed of and not autoclaved. So the, um, the recommendation is really to make sure that you're using instruments that can be <coughs> autoclaved at that high temperature rather than instruments that require other forms of, of um, decontamination that don't use such high temperatures. So you're saying that the NICE guidelines have been effective and the autoclaving works? that the evidence is that it works, or, or, or am I misinterpreting what you say? No, the, the recommendations are put in place um, on a precautionary basis to implement measures that can be done across the board for every single um, circumstance where those instruments are used. Um, for people where we know there is an increased risk, autoclaving isn't, isn't used as a means to decontaminate, those instruments are destroyed. Why, why is there a discrete review panel? Why is one required for assessment of technologies associated with hospital infection control? Couldn't it be assessed in the sort of normal way by nights? Are you referring to the rapid review panel now? Yes, I think so. Okay. Uh, I think that's a, a, a very good question. We set up the rapid review panel uh, in the early 2000s at the specific request of uh, UK chief medical officers, and it's a, a specific means of rapidly reviewing, as you know, um, new technologies um, uh, and, and new ways of, of providing for hospital infection control. I think given the um, particular concerns that were in place then around hospital infection control and still continue, it's appropriate to have a specific mechanism. We haven't looked specifically at whether that's something that NICE should take over uh, instead of us doing it, but at the moment we continue to run that, that programme and we're confident in the, in the processes that that panel uh, undertakes. Thank you. Uh, right, just before I get on to it, I want to ask about the at-risk goal, but um, Dr. Jimmy, just, just, I was just thinking about we, what you were saying, I, I can understand entirely um, the rationale for, of using um, single-use instruments on at-risk patients. But the, the concept of, of, of having, of keeping discrete sets of instruments um, uh, and not mixing. Again, I could understand that if we were dealing with something that you could reasonably expect to diagnose infection um, within a limited period, but uh, we have a long latency with this disease, um, unless you're going to keep very prodigious lists of, of, of what instruments were used on what patient at what time. Um, okay. you, you don't have a traceability, do you? So it's, it's not, um, th there are fairly detailed lists of what instruments have been mm. used on, on what people at what time, but um, I'm referring to keeping sets together as complete sets rather yeah. than splitting the, the various instruments between different sets. Um, otherwise, uh, the discrete sets are for people born after 1996, so that's for all people born after 1996. Yeah, no, I, I, I mean, as I say, I, I, I can see an underlying logic, but, but in practice it would seem to me that by the time you have any 
reasonable knowledge of, of infection, that set will have been used on a great number of patients if, if you have got as, as, as a comprehensive records as, as, as you like. And therefore, the traceability is, is extremely limited. But perhaps I'm just being stupid. Well, that, there is a very good traceability now introduced, um, and that has been one of the recommendations that's um, come about through the uh, fairly intensive scrutiny that uh, decontamination and instrument management have been under over the last uh, decades. Um, certainly when we've uh, had lookbacks of surgical incidents, uh, people have been able to trace quite carefully yeah. what instruments have been used on what patients um, for the lookback period that's required. Okay. Okay, well, let, let's move on then to the, um, and I think Dr. Chick, you probably are the right person to answer the Dr. Cosford, if it's you, if you want to please, thanks so much. Um, when you have identified somebody as um, belonging on an at-risk register for either uh, classical CJT or, or variant CJT, what actually happens? How, how, are, they, how are they notified? Okay. Um, this may depend on how many people are involved. Um, sometimes it's one or two people identified in relation to a particular incident. Sometimes there are, are tens and, and sometimes even more. Um, if in, in all cases, um, the aim is to provide as much information and support as possible. Um, usually it involves uh, the patient's GP or if they're under the care of a, a clinical <coughs> specialist, um, that person as well, so that there is so someone who is able to support them and explain the risks. Um, there's a whole suite of written information that has been produced um, which has been refined over the years to try and make it as clear and comprehensive as possible. Could, could we have a copy? Uh, yes, you certainly can. Yeah. Um, and that's provided both to the, the person who's been informed that they're at increased risk and their general practitioner. We usually also involve the public health team locally because there's usually um, a further amount of public health follow-up that's required. All of this is coordinated, um, in particular, to make sure that the timing is right so that people don't find out about their risk through, uh, for example, the media um, before um, the systems are set up to support them. For large-scale um, notification exercises, there is usually a helpline. Um, that's been done through um, NHS Direct previously, but it, it may vary depending on the circumstance. Um, and there is usually a great deal of planning and involvement of the relevant national services who are there to advise, be it an incident that relates to blood or um, plasma products or surgery. Okay, so that, that follow-up, that would include psychological support if required, it would, um, it would include um, some surveillance for any neurological signs that may develop? Is, is that um, the the uh, addresses and contact details for support for people who are informed they're at increased risk are the two national centres, the National um, Prion Clinic and the um, CJD Research and Surveillance Unit in Edinburgh, and people are provided with those contact details. Um, also, where appropriate, the CJD Support Network, who are a patient group who are used to um, counselling families and, and people affected by CJD. Um, there is follow-up, um, which follows people up, and we know it may be required for a long term, given the, the potential low doses of exposure in some cases and the long incubation period, which is um, set up to follow up long term any um, development of neurological symptoms or CJD in people who've been told that they're at increased risk. And that's both to understand what those risks are by iatrogenic transmission um, and also to provide a means to monitor that the public health measures in place have been effective. Right. And early on in that process is the question of consent to post-mortem examination raised? Um, so far, um, it has been raised with a subset of individuals who were invited to take part in research activities. So when they were invited to take part, they were asked if they wished to give a consent to post-mortem. Um, and there was a mixed response to that. Um, 
So uh, by mixed response, um, what sort of proportion? So. Uh, not everybody was asked, not everybody was in a, um, a, a good um, position to be asked. They were either um, uh, in a fragile health yeah. condition or uh, it wasn't thought appropriate for other reasons. So uh, 27 people were asked, um, 11 of whom said yes, 8 of whom uh, were not asked and, and, and 6 declined. Um, so more people who were asked said yes than no. But it still wasn't a very high. So this is, I mean, this is posing quite a significant problem in terms of overall epidemiology, isn't it? In, in working out, in being able to separate out dementias from CJD at, at, at later stages, and uh, actually identifying whether you're at risk or were at risk at all, or, or, or simply. Um, so th those 27 people uh, are from the, the, the small cohort that Public Health England follows up of around 400 people. There are, there are a larger number amongst the 6,000 identified in total who are also being followed up primarily by the UK Haemophilia Doctors' Organisation. Um, there are other methods in place to um, identify whether people have developed neurological symptoms or whether they've um, developed and died from variant CJD. And to date, um, but other than the two um, asymptomatic infections that have been uh, discussed previously, um, there haven't been any um, deaths or other identification of CJD in this cohort. All right. Okay. Uh, last, last question. There are various um, uh, recommendations in terms of what somebody who is at risk should or should, more importantly, should not do. Have you any uh, view as to uh, to what extent that those those um, precautions are actually working? To what extent people do do as they are asked to do? Um, uh, do the G do they have GPs monitor whether that is the case? Uh, what? Uh, uh, how do you know, in other words, that the precautions are you 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 put it you have suggested are actually putting put in place in practice? Okay, um, so. For, uh, speaking about the cohort that, uh, that we have the responsibility for, we um, ask the GP of, the, of the, the person to confirm that they have, in fact, been notified and received the information. Um, I know that I receive an awful lot of calls. Um, it's a two-way process, um, mostly from infection control teams who are double-checking. They've got a patient in front of them who has um, answered yes to a number of screening questions that are put in place for surg surgery and they are often phoning to confirm or clarify the information they've been given. So I know that the screening pre-surgery is in place. I know I also have heard from patients who are calling themselves to understand their risk better. So um, it's anecdotal evidence but I receive a, a, a good number of calls um, at least one a week from infection control teams who are implementing the guidance and also taking the surgical um, precautions that are And that pre-surgical screening set of questions, that, that's, that's, that's for universal, that's, that's, that's standard practice? Um, it should be. It's been um, a, a guidance published by the ACDP TSC um, subgroup. It's part of a, a suite of guidance that infection control teams should be aware of. Yep. Dr. Cosworth, you, you, you looked as if you wanted to add something. But. Um, uh, no, I'm you're, you're happy, with that, <laughs> that, happy with that response. I, I, I mean, the whole issue of lookbacks is a very delicate one mm. because clearly, usually, when we're looking back and identifying patients who've been exposed to a risk, it's because there's a benefit potentially to them as an individual. In this case, with uh, being at risk of CJD, it's because we want them to take precautions on a very precautionary principle to prevent the uh, opportunity of further transmission if they do happen to be infected. And the actual benefit to them as an individual is very limited. So it is a very delicate area. We're aware of that. Uh, and, and our emphasis is to do two things. One is 
to enable and encourage them to take those precautions and the second is to be aware of the potential implications for them and the psychological concerns that they will have and make sure that both their GP and their normal family doctor arrangements are in place to support them and that there's some specific support through the CJD network and others where they can get that support and advice uh, and as you've heard Dr Shinka herself receives calls directly so we are uh, you know, we do all that we can to make sure that both those sides are, are taken account of. Thank you very much. And last but no least, Professor Newberg has been very patiently <laughs> sitting there, um, but a very important subject area really for the staff in the Royal Cornwall Hospital in my constituency and patients in my constituency waiting for transplants, as I'm sure we have, all my colleagues here have people really desperately waiting for transplants. So if you could give us an update on what progress has been made to date in implementing the um, taking organ transplantation to 2020 strategy. All right, well, thanks very much. Um, it, it's a broad front, and I think the, one of the key issues, of course, it's a strategy for the UK, not just for NHSBT, and it involves um, looking at all aspects of the journey from the general public uh, engaging in the concept of donation, agreeing to donation, right to the other end of making sure that we encourage surgeons to use all organs wherever appropriate for the patients, making the appropriate risk decision, um, the risk management, because as you know, transplantation compared with um, blood transfusion is, 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 is um, a risky process, it involves a balance of risks. Um, so it's across the board. We have set up an oversight group which is chaired by Elizabeth Buggins and she's making sure that not only NHSBT does its bit, but other parts, the departments of health, the professions, the organisations, the hospitals, they also do their bit. We are making overall progress in that donation and transplants are continuing to increase. Um, we reached the 50% target by a whisker, but we did last year and donations have increased by a further 10% this year. So we're making progress, but there's still a long way to go, and it's right across the piece that we need to, to work. Um, the biggest challenge, as you know, is the consent rate or the refusal rate. Um, the UK has, was just picked by the Netherlands last year at having the highest refusal rate, um, and that involves a strategy to, uh, and, and the paper went to the board, of NHSBT to try and understand why people say no and how we can work with our specialist nurses to encourage people to make the right decision. Um, so that is a major piece of work. The other major piece of work that we're involved with is particularly working with the surgeons to try and ensure that all usable organs are used. Um, and I think that's a difficult piece of work, we can influence the surgeons and support them, and, and that is the other major piece, but there's a lot of other bits of work in between. You've given us some, some very encouraging news about you know, progress towards the very clearly defined targets, and, this, and you've laid out the overall strategy, but there was a, a commitment that there would need to be detailed operational plans across the various organisations that you've mentioned. I understand there's a lot of people involved in driving the sort of change that we want to see. So have those operational, detailed operational plans um, been submitted? And if they haven't, why not? As far as NHSBT is concerned, uh, and I, I can only really speak for ourselves, yes, we have agreed our short-term and our longer-term plans. They are in place. We've already delivered on some of the um, targets that we've set and we're working on others, as I say, strategies to increase public behaviour. The strategy has gone to the board and then it will go up for discussion with the Departments of Health. There will be resource implications in that. Um, the workforce planning to see how our specialist nurses can work more effectively to obtain consent wherever it's appropriate and possible. That's another major piece of work that's going on we're working with the clinicians to provide, and we've recently reissued guidance and support. We're working with them 
and the commissioners to get peer review to try and get the clinicians themselves to take ownership of this and provide support and guidance to make sure they make the right decision and when they don't to use organs to understand very clearly why not. Um, so against our, our own target and our own strategy we are on target. And the other partners that you've mentioned with their detailed operational plans? Um, I think the departments can probably best speak for okay. themselves. Um, but as an organisation, we can only work with influence. We can't tell professional organisations what to do. We can't tell hospitals what to do. We can work with them. And I have to say that they do engage on the whole well. There's some areas where we don't get good engagement from the hospitals. But again, we're just working hard to improve that. You mentioned that um, recommendations have gone up to the Department of Health, which have resource implications. When, you're ex when do you think they're going to be considered? I think we have to make a strong business case. And they'll be... Dis so, 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 so it's gone to the board at the moment, and when right. it's approved, then it'll go to the department. And so when would you expect the Department of Health to receive those? If the board approves it, I would hope this calendar year, certainly, if not earlier. My final question um, is really to do with, I think a lot of us have been uh, contacted by um, the, the major organisations working with cystic fibrosis. Certainly I visited the unit in my own hospital and they're very keen um, that you consider, we reconsider how we go about allocating suitable lungs, um, whether we should have um, a more national allocation basis over the regional one. So, to what extent have you considered the representations that you've heard from cystic fibrosis and other illnesses and conditions about enabling a different way for the organs to be allocated? We've worked closely, and in fact, we, I do have sort of infrequent but uh, calls with Ed Owen uh, uh, in the Cystic Fibrosis Trust. We're not wedded to any one particular allocation scheme and we operate across the different organs, sometimes zonal allocations, sometimes national allocations, and for kidneys, for example, we have a national allocation at the moment for deceased kidneys after brain death, but a local one for... Um, as far as lungs are concerned, I think there are constraints with the national allocation scheme because of the time frame between retrieval and implantation um, but we discussed yesterday, in fact, at our cardiothoracic advisory group, and we agreed that we would move towards a national allocation scheme for um, urgent lung recipients and a zonal allocation for, um, for non-urgent patients. We do need to model this first because sometimes a national allocation Firstly, we have to make sure that the allocation is right because for lung transplants in particular, we have largely two broad groups. One is the cystic fibrosis patients and the other is those with pulmonary fibrosis, which is scarring of the lungs. The cystic fibrosis patients tend to be younger, but they tend to have a much more generalised disease. They tend to have infections in the lungs and elsewhere. They tend to have diabetes. They tend to be malnourished. The pulmonary fibrosis patients tend to be older and otherwise fitter. So that gives rise to several problems. The first is how do you have a system that takes these two very different populations and, and, and puts them in the ranking order? Secondly, you do need to match your donor lungs or other organs with your recipients. Uh, not only issues such as blood group height, volume of lungs and so on, but also if you have a slight a, a lung that may not function well, you want to put it into a fitter patient, and so you do need to mix and match. And even with kidneys, where we have a national allocation scheme, and this is paralleled across other countries, um, that where a kidney is allocated to a specific appropriately matched patient, in only about 35% of cases does the first-ranked patient 
get the organ. So if a national allocation scheme, uh, we, we need to model that first and make sure that if we do go down that route, we can do it safely and effectively and we achieve the desired effect. We've seen in other countries where they've introduced national allocation schemes that they've had unintended consequences. And in Germany, for example, where they had a liver national allocation scheme, results were a lot worse. On the other hand, in the US where it was done, death on the waiting list fell dramatically. Outcomes were not significantly adversely affected. Resource utilization was increased. Um, so we would need to be sure that any, if we did move to that, and we're very happy to, to do that, if that's going to produce a better outcome for the patients, then of course we'll implement that. Um, so we're looking, the clinicians are now have accepted the proposals, and if the modeling um, suggests it benefits the patients, then we will introduce that for, for, for urgent lung patients monitor it, if we get the desired improvement in outcomes, then we'll extend it to the other patients. If not, we'll modify it. So we're not wedded to any uh, uh, one model. I think the other point, uh, so to go on a bit, um, is I think when you have an allocation scheme, they're difficult because you're trying to balance a number of competing constraints. You want to reduce deaths on the waiting list. You need to ensure equity of access so all the different people with different conditions can benefit. And you also need to look at some degree of outcome. Uh, historically, people used to transplant very, very sick patients. All right, they didn't die on the waiting list, but they died shortly afterwards. So it was, if you like it, not a good use of that organ, which somebody else could have had. So you've got to balance different components which are sometimes conflicting and that's why um, they're not always straightforward you don't always get the right outcome so but it, it, as I say we do have national schemes for some organs we're certainly look we've agreed to adopt this subject to the modeling showing that it's likely to benefit patients Sorry for the long answer. No, I'm answer. very pleased, but I'm sure we'd all love yeah. to discuss this further, but I think we're out of time. We're, we're, we're running out of time because we've got the Minister waiting for us outside. So uh, thank you very much indeed for your contribution this morning. Um, we'll go straight on to the second panel. Yeah. Uh, Minister Dame Sally, thank you very much for uh, coming uh, this morning. Uh, we realise that uh, people are on a pretty tight timetable, so if, if we can, we'll uh, uh, get um, straight in. Um, and, and I really want to start uh, the questioning simply by asking why the decision was made uh, to uh, dissolve the spongiform encephalopathy advisory committee SEAC uh, in 2011 and uh, did you support that decision? Um, well, Chairman, thank you very much for asking us here today. And I, I say up front that this is a highly technical and scientific area, so there will be uh, many occasions in which I defer to the CMO. The decision you're referring to obviously took place before I was a minister. 
Uh, my understanding is that it was felt that the advice that uh, that committee supplied uh, could be equally well supplied by uh, other expert committees, but perhaps as Sally was in post at the time, she could comment further. Yes, as you know, we have not had a case of new variant CJD since a new case since 2010, and there was an effort to rationalise all our scientific committees to make sure that we were not wasting scientists' time, but that for policy development uh, we had the best advice. So um, we rationalise them and what we have here to share with you are the before and after charts of the committees. So um, you may want those to look at. And I did support it because it had done a very good job, but we remained with two major uh, advisory committees, SABTO, um, safety of blood in uh, blood, tissues and organs, and ACDP, Advisory Committee on Dangerous Pathogens. And there had always been a bit of an overlap, so now between... But there are two. still multiple bodies. Uh, I haven't seen them before and after chart yet, but my understanding there are still multiple bodies uh, advising on um, CJD. Uh, it, yes. Does that remain sensible, or would you want, want to further rationalise it? It is functioning well at the moment. I see no reason to alter it at this time. Okay. But um, look forward to hearing your advice, of course. That, and, and in terms of your own role, um, what, what role do you play in advising uh, the Minister on matters related to blood safety? I, as CMO, am the independent medical advisor on all medical things to the UK government and uh, on public health to the Department of Health, well, the government in England. Uh, so I review the advice in these areas, as in pub all public health areas, um, to ensure that I think it's been properly based on science and looks sensible, rigorous and sensible. That is um, supported by the fact that I'm also, as you know, the Chief Scientific Advisor to the Department. Meanwhile, uh, I am also uh, the head of the research division, so I I'm aware of and sign off to a certain extent the research that has been advised in this area. And how do you ensure that there is an integrated approach that covers um, uh, Scotland, Northern Ireland and uh, Wales as well? Well, as UK CMOs, we meet three or four times a year to discuss issues of public health and policy. And if we had concerns in this area, it would be on the uh, agenda. We have not needed to um, since I've been CMO, uh, but the committees um, do have representation from across the UK and the policy teams talk regularly as do the blood transfusion services. Ours is of course England and Wales, but they are in regular communication on all these issues and Public Health England and the Public Health Service of Scotland and Northern Ireland. So there's a lot of cross-talk in the interests of ensuring that our public and patients are well served. David. The government has acknowledged the potential value of a blood test capable of detecting variant CJD, but could it be doing more to support the development of such a test? My even question. Um, my, well, my understanding is that, um, I mean, there is quite a lot going on in this area. I mean, I think, you know, certainly as a minister, I'm open-minded to uh, receiving uh, advice around this. Um, but clearly, you know, like many other things, it will be based around being evidence-based and cost-effective. Um, but there's actually quite a lot of work going on in this area. Uh, the department is you know, funding a number of ongoing, not only surveillance work, but studies, as well as other non-DH funded studies going on. So um, I, I'm pretty satisfied that proportionate, particularly to the number of, for example, cases and deaths over the last 10 years or so, that actually there's a, there's a good body of work going on at the moment. So as I say, I'm open-minded to the fact that if evidence is presented to me that we can do something 
uh, that's cost effective and, and evidence based, then we would look at that. Right. Um, in 2013, Professor Collins submitted a proposal to the MRC worth approximately £750,000 to conduct further work to validate a test that he developed and was in use at the MRC. Um, but this was turned down. And I wonder if either of you have any comment on this and whether the government proposes to take this forward. Because what strikes me is that the amount of money is tiny in the scheme of things here. And we have a test which was working effectively on a small scale. And it seems very strange to me that uh, nothing has been done to take this forward. Let me take this. Um, so clearly we have limited budgets, both for health care public health and for research. The MRC gives core funding to um, Sir John's unit, the MRC Prion unit, um, every year, and they used some of that to develop the test. They also gave an additional 300,000 to help develop this blood test. Um, there was an application last year that was turned down by the peer review uh, because of a number of issues, one being insufficient justification in its use for screening, and he has not gone back to them with any further applications. Uh, indeed, he, he has led them to believe he's exploring other avenues to, of funding for the blood test project. I should say that the MRC and ourselves have given a lot of money to this area, um, of Prion Research and particularly to Sir John. We right. from the department have given around 14 million to him over the last 10 years from our policy research program, which is more than any other individual gets from the policy research program for any subject. The MRC gives um, the Prion unit six million pounds each year um, in addition to some supplementary funding of a further five million since 2007. So he is in receipt of significant funds. Meanwhile, from the NIHR Biomedical Research Centre at University College, uh, I understand that about 100,000 each year has been used at the discretion of University College academics to support his work. And of course, he receives funding because um, from the university because he is listed on the hefty QR submissions, the RAE submissions, and they get significant funding. Right, I, I understand that. And thank you for explaining the, the, the amount of money that, 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 that goes across. But in this instance, I, and I'm interested to hear you say that Professor Collinch has apparently moved on, because I understand that, it, that the, this was turned down because of the issue about sensitivity but he says that a 71% is perfectly adequate to do the study that we propose to do. It could be that only 70% of people with variant CJD have prions in their blood, and the test is therefore picking up all of them. So is this not something that perhaps should be reconsidered, and, and if the MRC aren't going to do it, then it should, be, should fall within one of these funding schemes that you've described, don't you? The integrity of research in this country is based on a peer review system. I would not want to second guess the peer right. review of the Medical Research Council. Okay. Minister, you referred to a number of studies in, your, in answer to my opening question. Could you be a bit more specific and tell us what studies? Well, taken. I'm going to ask the Chief Medical Officer to, um, to uh, look at that. In fact, I think Dame Sally actually referred to some of them in her previous answer that are going on. And obviously some of them have been conducted by Professor Collinge. Uh, I believe that 20% of the funding that's been given to Prion Research has actually been given uh, to projects led by him. But I'll ask Dame Sally to comment on some of the specific projects. So since 2002, uh, he's had from us over £3 million for the National Prion Monitoring Cohort. Um, starting in 2006, and I was personally involved in ensuring this grant, he received um, over £7 million for the development of effective treatments for prion infection, working with GlaxoSmithKline, looking at their library of compounds, and I was the one that 
asked GSK to open up their library and negotiated that. Uh, we gave him 2.75 million for the prior and one clinical trial, 1.6 million for a, a, some animal work involving transgenic mice, so that's the last decade. Of course, we've funded a lot of other work. For instance, at the moment, we've got um, £46 million pounds worth of active research underway in decontamination across the UK. So we continue. Indeed, at the moment, we have a ring-fenced budget. It is the only ring-fenced budget in the Department of Health's um, budget. Uh, of five million pounds. Right, so you're saying new that overall that there's a lot of there's a lot of research and a lot of money available for this uh, this area. Is that right? There is a fair amount of money, and we have to balance okay. everything together. Right. Just a couple of further questions, Joe, if I may, on related but different subject. How many blood samples from known variant CJD patients are currently held in the UK? And the second question related to that is how many of these are available to commercial test developers, please? Um, I know it's one, one and a half tablespoons. I'm just looking for the actual numbers for you. Oh, thank you. Oh. So um, we have got uh, seven individual cases held in citrate anticoagulant and nine individual cases held in... Uh, pink bottles, um, EDTA anticoagulant. So that is um, 14, 16 uh, patients. Of course, the National Prion Unit hold other ones themselves. So in that Lancet paper uh, on Sir John's um, test showing the 70% sensitivity, I think he used 21 samples from right. patients. Okay, fine. Uh, and they are available following a proper protocol to all right. people. So, so do the number of, does, are you saying that the number of samples that he uses was small? Is that what you're implying? It was large compared with what anyone else will be able to use in being 21, um, where we only have uh, 16 so you, held at NIBS. Okay, so my last question, Chair, if I may, is why was the prionics test validated on the basis of only two samples, when this could not possibly have given a statistically significant result? I don't have the details. We will send those right. to you, but it is Can not a check? test in routine use. It's not a... It's not no, in routine right. use, as far as I'm aware, but we will send you the details. Okay. Just, okay. Just, just before we move off the issues of money, you talked about a ring-fenced yes. budget. Uh, Minister, is the intention that that ring fence remains after 2015? Well, there's no, no proposal has been put to me to remove that, and I think on the basis of, and I mean, I can't commit what would happen in the future and what any future government might think, but it seems to me that we have established uh, an approach to this particularly serious uh, issue that's uh, extremely precautionary. Um, if, in terms of looking at the, the amount of money spent, uh, the ring fence budget, and the number of actual cases, and I think that's right to be uh, to take an extreme precautionary position. Um, so certainly, I have no intention to challenge that. Um, and obviously, um, successive governments would take a different view. But it seems to me that that's been a consistent picture uh, since, obviously, the height of the whole uh, the crisis. And so, successive governments have taken that precautionary principle. Uh, Graham. Nice, NICE issued guidelines in 2006 to uh, help stop the transmission of CJD during surgical operations. We've been told that that, that hasn't been universally, universally implemented. What are, what are the consequences of that and, and, and what are you doing about it, if anything? Um, I brought for you if you needed it, all the official guidance, so the nice guidance is in there, the significant guidance, you will know that when NICE issues guidance, the NHS is expected to implement it within uh, three months. Um, I was not aware, this is the first I've heard, that places are not um, 
using the guidance, uh, we would have to ask the CQC, as our uh, agency for inspection, whether they had picked that up, um, and talk to the, probably the Royal College of Surgeons, because if that is the case, it is unacceptable because we are concerned about the transmission of disease, not only prions, but other diseases. I, I can't give you the reference, but I know so that in 2011, a study found that the guidance had not been fully implemented in a number of trusts, no. part, partly, because, partly because of resource uh, issues. So I'm slightly surprised that you're not aware of that, but if you if, if you can give us a note on, on, on what you think about it, that would be that would be helpful. What do you think generally about um, the measures that are currently in place to prevent the transmission of prions? Do you consider them to be adequate? In the light of our present knowledge, our um, scientific advisory committees advise us that they are in, you know, in the right place. We have implemented everything that the scientific advisory committees have said are effective and cost effective. Right. The Department of Health Working Group has acknowledged that the standard wash procedures don't clean surgical instruments, they don't get rid of the, 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 the uh, prions, yet there, there is technology available for doing that. Do you, are you trying to solve that issue? And just, just going back to the previous discussion with the previous panel, is your understanding that autoclaving surgical instruments gets rid of the, the prion contamination or, or, or not? My understanding is because they're hydrophobic, they're difficult to get off surgical instruments. They, they, and they that, bond in a particular way. Yeah, and that autoclaving on its own does not remove them. Um, if, I, if I'm wrong, we'll have to <laughs> tell you. That, that was my understanding. Yeah, right, that is my understanding. Um, we have clearly moved on a precautionary principle back in 2007 to single-use dental reamers and dental equipment for root canals because, and it was a precautionary principle that took us there. We tried um, single-use in uh, tonsillectomy, brought it in rather fast and there were patients who bled and eat sadly a death so we had to reverse that. But there is a lot of work um, to make sure that where possible single use is used and that it is, uh, that decontamination is properly done. There's more to do, as I said, we've got a large 46 million pounds worth of research ongoing that started in 2011 on decontamination that most of them will be reporting later this year. We, we, and following that, clearly, we may need to change what we're doing. We're told that there is a technology available for doing it. Do, do, you, do you accept that? And are, are you looking to put that into standard procedures? If you are talking about Sir John's and um, the DuPont test, um, decontamination thing, then I can tell you the rapid review panel gave it a level two uh, assessment. Um, Which and means? It means basic research and development has been completed and the product may have potential value. In use, evaluation trials are now needed in an NHS clinical setting. So it is for the company to do that, and we have been told that DuPont have not chosen to do that at this time. I should perhaps highlight to you, it would, even if effective, be quite a difficult test to introduce into the NHS because it would involve changing the central sterile um, departments of every hospital their processes and indeed some of their other machinery. So it wouldn't just be the cost of it, were it to prove to be perfection, it would have massive knock-on costs 
elsewhere in the, in the sterilization department system. Thank you. Um. Thank you, Chair. Um, Minister uh, and, and Dame Sally, we've been hearing this morning uh, in the last session and this about the, the three technologies that are being developed uh, to which, with the support of um, the, the government, the MRC, um, and we know that they haven't been adopted more widely. Can I just ask in your view, what message is that giving to, to companies who are looking at developing products in this field? Um, and we have received some, some criticism about that. And can, can I ask, do you think that there's anything that the government can do to make it clearer to these companies exactly what, uh, what um, technologies that the government would be wanting them to invest in for the future? Um, well, Ms. Ash, are you talking about rely on principally this, um, the wash, the, sur the, the surgical wash? Um, well, because that's the one the obviously I'm aware of, and I've, I've met Professor Collins, she came in uh, to, you know, I had a meeting with him shortly after I was appointed and discussed that. Uh, and, you know, I'm obviously aware of that criticism. Uh, from my point of view, I mean, you know, I'm not a scientist. You know, this is very technical for me, so I have to ask simple common sense questions as a minister. Um, is, is someone presenting to me evidence that something can be very effective on the base of evidence and also cost effective? Now, you know, even if that was the case, it wouldn't be my decision as a minister to then say, right, that's something everyone must use, because obviously there are, not, there are other people producing products uh, that the NHS might want to buy and use. But the first test that has to be met is, you know, has something passed an evidence test of effectiveness and could it potentially be implemented in a cost-effective way? And, it, and there's nothing, as far as I understand it, to stop the company that developed this one taking matters further, you know, going back to the rapid review panel, doing further development and further tests. I mean, nothing has been put in the way of that. Um, but, you know, from my point of view, uh, as a minister, it would be completely inappropriate to sort of sit in my office and, if you like, pick winners uh, that haven't gone through a proper... Um, a proper process. So I rely on, you know, the evidence presented to me of things having gone through a process. And as far as I can see, no barriers have been put in the way of this product. Um, but there is, there is still some way to go for the people behind it to prove that it can be effective and cost effective. I appreciate that and understand where you're coming from, Minister. But just playing devil's advocate, I'd say that the Perhaps there might not be barriers put up, but a, a company would want to know that a product might be used. So it might not be picking winners in terms of the, the companies and the producers of it, but perhaps giving an indication of what technologies are, are being looked for and would be invested in. Um, so can I ask, if, uh, would the government subsidise technologies if it became clear that they would be um, very helpful in terms of protecting public health? but would not be profitable for the, the companies who are producing the products? Well, our starting point is funding the research, obviously, which I think we've given evidence that there's a lot of research being funded. Um, the, the, the issue would then come to me, you know, it would be put to me that this is effective, but there are already processes in place for the NHS to consider the use of, <coughs> and don't forget for NICE, for example, to recommend the use of something that became a sort of gold standard. So there are, we have existing processes that I think are pretty robust um, and have to be because otherwise, you know, the, you, you would never be able to make decisions in this area. It's so complex, there's so much money involved, you have to have robust processes. I can't see anything in the processes we've already got that would stop a, an, an evidence-based effective uh, product uh, that could be used cost effectively being recommended to the NHS. Okay, thank you. Um, just a last question. This, uh, my understanding is that the technologies that we've mentioned, the, the prion filter, but also the, um, the MRC projects as well, and blood tests and the, the prion uh, inactivator, um, they were evaluated by different processes and, and different bodies at the time. Has that system now been rationalised as part of this, uh, this uh, diagram that we've got, or is that separate? Um, my, my concern would be that a complex system of this sort would put companies off, and it might be costly both for them and, and the government to have those different processes. So has that now been rationalised? It's a fairly smooth process. It's and quite clear that the rapid review panel 
uh, reviews technologies to reduce hospital acquired infection. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the AC uh, SABTO reviews uh, the issues around blood safety. Uh, I don't think that any part of the industry worth their salt has problems with the system, and if they do, they only have to ask us. Okay, thank you. And is that advice available equally to companies irrespective of size? Well, of course it is. So are, are you are open to propositions from uh, small... If they're asking how the system works and who will be assessing them and to what criteria, then that is easily available to everyone. Okay. Uh, David? Yeah, just following on from that, though, um, Chair, uh, ask the Minister, really, uh, this... this doesn't it make a difference that in this particular area, NHS England, or certainly the British NHS, would be one of the biggest and uh, almost exclusive markets for a product of this kind? And therefore, it isn't quite the same as, say, a, a, a drug with general applicability, where the markets can be found anywhere and, and Britain can either buy in or buy out. Mm. Companies need that confidence to know that there is a buyer. Actually, yeah, I understand the point you're making. Mm. I'm sorry. Sorry. No, it's all right. Mm. This isn't just a British problem. Well, I know, um, I know it's not exclusively British, but we are the biggest The market markets. would take in um, other countries in Europe as well. But not if the British NHS doesn't buy. I mean, there won't be a, there won't be a market without the British NHS. Unfortunately, there is a um, complaint from the medical devices industry that it is difficult to sell devices into the NHS even when they've been developed in the UK and they find it easier to sell abroad. And this may be no exception. Okay, well, I, I, I just think that if the normal market model doesn't necessarily apply where, where we have a, a centre of infection here, which is not, you know, there isn't a North American market, for instance. No, so I mean, Mr Heath, I mean, I, I do understand the point you're making, um, but equally, you know, in the conversation I had when I had the meeting, um, and my office sort of hinted at what you're saying, which is effectively to, should we almost say, you know, if you get this right, you know, we will recommend. Um, if somebody developed a effective cost, and if a scientifically evidenced cost-effective um, product that could be, as as Dame Sally said earlier without disproportionate cost incorporated into making our NHS safer, I see no reason why our NHS would not want to look at that. Mm. It, you know, it's no, it would be irrational if they didn't. Um, and, you know, the question then is, are we funding and supporting the development of some of this work? I think the answer to that is yes. I mean, I came at this very fresh, the meeting I had mm. with Professor Collins and others was very early on as a minister, so I had no sort of preconceptions about this and you know it seems to me that we have put investment and support um, in the way of developing these technologies but there is a point at which either the company involved or the market has to do some of that work and equally there's a, there is an e evidence level of effectiveness and cost effectiveness that has to be met. No I don't dispute that. Okay l let me talk about something completely different. Um, you, the CJD incidents panel disappeared um, was it last year, wasn't it? Exactly, I think. Um, are, are you confident that local management, local uh, reporting structures are sufficiently robust for CJD? Yes. Um, I think in this country uh, people have a very high index of suspicion for CJD, and if you um, look at the number of referrals, they do outnumber the number of cases, so we are, have a high index of suspicion. We have, um, a, we had an incident panel, it set up the processes and the advice when we stood it down was that the standard operating procedures should be good enough for anything that comes up, but if something new and different comes up, we will seek advice from the ACDP and other experts. So I think it's still a robust system. So you think it should be, and there is evidence to suggest it is? Yeah. yeah. Okay, dealing then with the um, cohort of at-risk 
uh, patients identified? Are you satisfied that they are getting the but the support that they need, but also the continuing surveillance that gives us a, a, a clear picture of what is happening to them, if anything. So, the, as I understand it, are two groups. Those who have been labelled at public health risk because they received pooled products that may have had an, um, an infective load, but probably because it's pooled very low, and those where through a look back, we know that they have received blood products um, where the patient, the donor subsequently had um, developed disease. The, both are very difficult for the recipient of that advice and how you follow them but I believe that the clinicians are giving good support and following the most highly at risk very carefully. The other, the public health at risk group are mainly um, people with inherited bleeding disorders and of course they get routine support and everything through, uh, through their routine management at haemophilia centres where they have counsellors and everyone there. Well, one, one area of the surveillance system, I suppose you would call it, um, which clearly isn't desperately successful at the moment, is post-mortem examination of people within that at-risk group who have subsequently died. Um, is that a concern, first of all, in terms of uh, getting <coughs> accurate figures for infection levels? And secondly, is, if it is a concern, well, what could be done to approve it? I think there are two problems here. One is that the um, rate of post-mortem examinations has gone down dramatically from being the norm to very low anyway. Um, and that is a cultural issue uh, that people don't want them. So not everyone consents. But if an at-risk person has con uh, or family consents, then the post-mortem is done to the standards that we would expect. So there's not a drop-off in quality of post-mortems, and we will know whether the spleens, the tonsils, etc., are uh, have the relevant changes. So I, th I think the, then there's an issue of post-mortem studies to look at prevalence. And there's some discussion at the moment with my research team whether we could and should fund an elderly uh, cohort uh, through post-mortems to look at prevalence. And we're looking at that to see whether it is doable and cost-effective. Yes, without that, we really have no idea if an elderly person contracts a, a dementia um, uh, distinguishing that from a CJD um, prior to death is, is, is clinically quite difficult. And if so we don't really know the prevalence, do we? We don't know the prevalence, but it is before the BSC uh, problem arose. So the assumption in our elderly people, and it is an assumption not proven by science, is that it will be low or negligible. But without doing such a study, we don't know. Can I just comment on your previous question, Mr Heath? Um, my post bag from Members of Parliament is a very good indicator of whether we're getting things right on all sorts of issues, and it's extremely wide-ranging, as is my portfolio. To the best of my knowledge, and I think I would remember it, I haven't had a letter from a Member of Parliament on behalf of a patient you asked about, are we looking after people and uh, supporting them well enough? And there are a number of other areas in which I get many uh, letters from Members of Parliament on behalf of their constituents. Uh, this isn't to date one of them, so in as much as my post bag is quite a good early warning signal on where we're not getting things right, it hasn't alerted me to the fact that we're not getting that support right in this area. That's very helpful. Thank you. But th that's no reason, of course, to be complacent because this is a very serious condition. Believe me, Mr Miller, um, this is one area, given the history of yeah. this disease, that I don't think any minister would ever be complacent in. Stephen. Thank you. I've just got a couple of questions on the National CJD Research and Surveillance Unit. You'll probably be aware that the current funding goes up to 2015. Are there any plans to continue that funding beyond then? Um, they need to make an application, but I would 
be surprised if they didn't receive funding. However, I can't promise it because that is in a different government, a different comprehensive spending review, and they haven't submitted an application. I mean, I can't speculate in a hypothetical, but I've said in my earlier evidence that the, the view that successive governments have taken has been a very precautionary one in this area, but clearly that, that hasn't come to me as a minister for a decision. Okay. I had a correction. They have a contract till 2017. Yeah. We're funding them till at least then. Oh, right, okay, thank you. Well, it, it's currently based at the University of Edinburgh, which is, of course, in Scotland. Have any negotiations and discussions uh, taken place as to what would happen if, if Scotland votes for independence in September? No, we're not, we're not making any... I don't think any part of government to make any sort of pre-independence plans. That's, uh, that's not something we've had a discussion on. Okay. Uh, the unit has submitted to the department a proposal for the investigation of atypical dementia in the elderly. Have you been able to look at that proposal? Have you given it any consideration at all? That is the proposal I just mentioned um, and the R&D team and policy team are going to go and discuss it with them. Okay. Okay. Sarah? And least moving on to the whole area of transplantation and I was wondering if you could give us an update on the actions the Department of Health has taken to implement the taking of organ transplantation to 2020 strategy. Well perhaps if I can comment on one aspect of it as an, as a, as an example of where I'm sort of quite actively involved. Um, I'm very aware that you know, one of the big challenges in this area is actually around consent, uh, just as much as it is the actual number of people on the register. Uh, around 100 families, I think it was uh, for the last year we have figures, actually overrode the wishes of somebody who was on the organ uh, donor register um, at, the, at that you know, very difficult moment the family was asked. So consent's a big issue and actually the consent rates are wildly varying between different communities. Uh, so, for example, the family refusal rate in um, BAME communities is around 80% compared to 25% as a national average. So that's where we get our 40% sort of figures, so very divergent figures. Um, so um, two actions we're taking forward in that area. Uh, I'm attending, I hope, a diary committee, the launch of the Peer Educator Programme in Birmingham. That's where we're looking to create local champions uh, within particular communities to champion uh, both, both organ donation and, and the consent issue. And we're planning some activities for Transplant Week in the second week of July, in which I'm planning and hope to involve parliamentarians uh, particularly those representing constituencies where raising the profile of these issues would be particularly helpful. So that's just a couple of examples of areas where uh, direct things directly within the Department of Health remit uh, we're trying to take forward from, from the strategy. That's extremely helpful because Professor Newbugger, who we took evidence from this morning, also highlighted this issue of consent and there is a very good target of 80% consent within the strategy, so it's very encouraging to hear. Um, of the activities that you plan, particularly around community champions. I think where you do have examples, where people it will come forward, it's a, it's a very powerful thing. But it is a very ambitious target, the 80%. So does the government have any plans to review its position on presumed consent? Um, well, we're certainly going to watch what happens in Wales, of course. Um, we have no current plans to go down that road uh, ourselves, but um, I'll be watching with interest. You know, clearly there are you know, potential risks as well as potential benefits, and so it's important to assess those. Um, as I say, I think because, because of what we know about the problems of consent, um, I think it's really important to not just think that the only issue is about the number of organs. I mean, it wouldn't actually alter the pool of suitable donors in any given year. Uh, it, what you would be looking to do is raise the proportion of them on the register. But if, of course, you didn't tackle consent rates, you wouldn't have anything like the impact. So, and at the same time, what we don't know, but there's some quite a lot of research to suggest it might have a negative impact on people being on the register. So, so we need to look at that. We're going to watch it with interest, but we have no current plans to go in that direction. And Professor Newburger talked about um, issues around uh, training 
health professionals at this very difficult moment, as you say, when they're faced with a loss of a loved one and securing their consent to enable the donation of organs. Um, and he was talking that this was a particular issue that he felt was a barrier to uh, hitting those targets. So, you know, what plans has the department got to work with um, professionals, nurses, doctors in hospitals to again drive up those consent rates? Well, we've already got, um, there is already work going on and, and um, a group of highly trained professionals, in the case of nurses going by the somewhat unlikely acronym of SNODs, um, uh, are already basically their specialist nurses uh, on organ donation and actually they work embedded within IC units and so they will start working or talking to families actually um, before death potentially uh, and starting to look at how they can prepare to have that conversation so those we've already got that those highly trained individuals and I think we're seeing that where they are in place uh, they can be very effective. So I think that's really important to do that work. I mean, it's a, you, know, you can't think of a more sensitive time to put a very difficult decision to people. Uh, and so the more trained people are, um, the more likely we are to see consent rates uh, rise. And of course, some families consent to um, someone becoming an organ donor who's not on the register. So it's not that they, that, that can happen. Yeah. Um, many donations are from people who are not on the register. Uh, but that sort of specialist uh, medical support is already there and effective. And Professor Newberger also talked about issues with, say, some surgeons accept, accepting particular um, organs uh, for, uh, for transplantation. And he felt, again, that was an area that needed uh, more attention. Now, the strategy commits the government to a whole series of action plans. And I'm just wondering to what extent the department is monitoring the delivery of the strategy and specifically getting the different pieces of the jigsaw signed up to their implementation plans. So there's an accountability meeting every three months and a big one annually between um, NHSBT and the department sponsors and this plan and the metrics in it are part of that. So it is kept to my own. And one of the first things I did was ask to meet NHS BNT when I became a minister. And I asked them the question, what can I do to support your work in particular, where can you know, I bring particular focus? And I was directed in particular towards some of this work around consent rates and, how, and in particular communities, which is what's led to you know, the things that we, I've got in my schedule. So um, you know, it's, a, it's a strategy that so far produced some really good results. I mean, there's sort of really terrific increases in, in donation, for example, registering for donation um, and donations themselves. But we know we've more to do. We aspire to be extremely good at this. Um, but we do keep pretty close to it. It's an area I'm personally very interested in. I know a number of parliamentary colleagues have done work in their own constituencies to try and address some of these particular issues. So it strikes me as an area where, you know, as a health minister, I'm also looking to see where I can involve parliamentary colleagues in um, actually sort of spreading the word in those areas that really require it. Thank you. Big great. In the mid-90s, we were getting horrific projections about, uh, about this uh, disease. They, they, they've not come to fruition. Over that period of time, what have we got right and what have we got wrong? in dealing with this de disease? Have we been lucky or very effective? I don't think this was luck. I think it was a planned cross-government movement. First of all, with animal feed and, and the progress made about slaughtering older animals, etc., so reducing the infectivity pool. Then for the primary infection, and that had a dramatic impact, and then we're concerned about secondary infection, person to person, and, and blood transfusion is the most obvious um, way that that comes through. And if you look at the data, which I know you have, you can see that first with leukodepletion filters, which probably remove about 40% of the infectivity, and then other changes, we've had an impact to try and make sure that we don't get into a vicious circle that despite it no longer being in the food chain and infecting, we aren't then continuing it. 
So I think we've made very good progress. Um, to date, all the probable and likely, seriously likely cases have been MM genotype. There was one possible case that was MV, a heterozygote, and we remain open to the concern that has yet to play out that there may be a longer incubation period in the heterozygotes, which is why we still are actively doing research and everything. This is not something that we can ignore and go away from on the precautionary principle, though that second epidemic has not hit us. It doesn't mean that we can sit back and say, problem solved, book closed. Okay. Uh, final question, um, stemming from earlier comments. In this particular area, is there a case for uh, scientific advisory committees uh, that exist under the new structure um, being responsible, at least reporting on, uh, the cost effectiveness of, uh, of new technologies? They do give advice on the cost effectiveness, but that has to be based on health economic modelling. That, but that's their advice, but it's not. It's not. Uh, uh, it, that's not a decision-making process. It's advice to you, is it? Uh, I'd have to go back and look to where the advice goes, but I would highlight to you as the Science and Technology Committee, you'd be very unhappy if I overruled expert scientific advice. Oh, absolutely. And I <laughs> don't make a habit of it. In fact, I can't think when I have. But. That's especially when ministers do it, we get upset. Yeah, well... I, my role is to, to give advice to the Minister. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for a very helpful evidence session. Order, order.